Thank you, Lord, for being who you are. And Father, in the midst of the storms, as well as in the midst of the calm and the beauty of your world and, and the distress that comes into every life, we praise you and exalt your name because you never change. And if you did change, Father, where would we be? So as we focus on your son and how he gave up everything to become flesh and blood so that he could take on the sins of the world and also experience pain and agony both physically, emotionally, and spiritually when you turned your back on him so that he could redeem flesh and blood. We praise you for that. We exalt you for that. May our minds be focused on him. And as the writer of this book, consider Jesus. And when you consider him, and when we focus on him, may we see him as everything that he is, and that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. When we started this, and we're going to review the first three chapters and then dig in a little deeper into chapter four today, we were told that in times past, God spoke to his people. There's so much packed into the first sentence or two of the book of Hebrews that you could dissect it forever. And as you know, me, sometimes I do. <laughs> okay, quit dissecting. Let's move on. But there's a lot to consider in it to set the premise for the message of the book. And so it's important that we refocus on that and remember what it's saying. In times past... So if the audience is people who know about the Old Testament and the history of the Jews, whether they're Jewish or not, I said, God did speak to people, didn't he? He chose different methods to choose them or to speak to them. He chose different people in different situations to speak to them. The message was always the same. And this is also the hope that we find in not only in Christ, but in the words of this book. The message hasn't changed. God's message doesn't change. So those who want to change God's message for today and say, well, God didn't really mean that. He wasn't in the modern times as if God had no idea what was going to happen. You know, So whatever he said in the past doesn't fit, so we'll make it more applicable to today's culture, has no validity when God's already taken care of that question. No, in times past... Well, how many cultures in times past are identical to our culture? None are identical to our culture, but how about this? How about the sins in those cultures? Are they pretty identical? Oh, my. Nothing new is, is a sin. Is There's no new sin. Oh, we came up with a different one. And now we're going to see if God will approve of it. No. The heart of man is what? deceitfully wicked, who can know it? And we're shocked as we're discovering just how wicked it can be. And I quote that verse frequently when I'm listening to the news. No wonder God said, who could know it? We, we couldn't comprehend the wickedness that some people can do. Now, not all of them, even though they're not believers, commit the heinous things that we see. But God was saying, our depravity is inborn. Okay. So the message that God gave at the very beginning and then later before he sent a flood as judgment, when he brought judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah, when he called the people out of slavery and delivered messages, what was this message always? Repent and turn to me. Repent and turn to me. That's still the message, isn't it? What the church, and I don't mean the the body of believers, I mean the, you know, ecclesiastical church in the world today is saying that's rather a harsh message, so let's don't address it that way. Let's say there's a God who loves us and he wants us to feel good about ourselves and to be happy. That's completely contrary to scripture, isn't it? So the premise of Hebrews is in times past if you want to go back and check it out, God isn't delivering a new message because he got the first one wrong. If he got the first one wrong, we would be rather foolish to follow him, wouldn't we? <laughs> you know, If you have a leader or somebody who, let's suppose we put somebody in a position of authority in a group that we belong to because we thought, you know, they're pretty good. They have a lot of answers. And after a while, every answer they gave us didn't turn out to be right. 
and we learned that we couldn't trust them, well, we'd be stupid to keep trusting them. But God's record is perfect, isn't it? Nobody else's is. So we can reflect back and prove to ourselves if it's necessary or to remind ourselves that, yes, he spoke the same thing and he will continually speak the same message until the time comes when he will no longer deliver that message of repentance because it will be too late. And that's the tragic time that will come one day. So he spoke through the prophets. They had different messages. They were being uh, used by God as God revealed himself to them in particular ways. We know that Moses, who we understand how he was raised. We don't know how much teaching he had uh, prior to the burning bush experience. But God spoke to him through a burning bush because that was the way that God chose to speak to him. Moses listened. He had some hesitations. Remember, he said, I can't talk. I need somebody to speak for me. But God said, you're the one I chose. You're going to do this. I'll give you somebody to help you. But my plan has always been that Moses would be. And one of the things we see when we begin the study of Hebrews is that Jesus is greater than Moses. Was Moses important? Absolutely. He had a role to fulfill, and God used him mightily. God chose, as he was getting ready to lead the people out of slavery, to give Moses the Ten Commandments, to see Moses as face-to-face as any man on earth could ever see him, to reveal himself to Moses, because as we go through the scriptures, and this is essential in understanding Hebrews, when we go to in times past, all those times past, each revelation revealed a little bit more of God's character until Christ came. He's the complete revelation, isn't he? That's why this book says he's supreme. His supremacy, his sovereignty cannot be mistaken, and it cannot be nullified, and it cannot be less than it is. It's everything that God has said. We can go back and prove it. What did he say in the Old Testament? Oh, it's true. It's fulfilled in Jesus Christ. So that's why he's higher than the angels. He's higher than Moses. Angels came and delivered several important messages in the Old Testament, didn't they? And remember when um, the angels came to Abraham and warned him? Okay, They came in the form of men. And they were able to warn Abraham about what was going to happen to Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay, God chose to use them to bring a message. They were very important. They could bring a message that you need to repent or this will happen. But could they save the people? No. They were delivering the message of the one who could. Moses was delivering the message from the one who could save them He could physically save them from slavery, but he couldn't save them from sin. There's no leader, no prophet in the Old Testament who could deliver them from sin. But they did. They took them to the one who could. Gals, that's our job. And that's our privilege. We can't deliver them from sin, can we? But we can take them to the one who can. And who is that one? That one is superior to all the angels and all the Moses types in the Old Testament. But more than that, he is superior because he chose to give up that superior position to come down to earth and not be here as an angel flitting around doing good deeds. He came down here and clothed himself in flesh. So the perfect messenger who could deliver the only true means of salvation took on flesh and blood like the ones to whom he was going to share that message with so that he himself could be the propitiation, the sacrifice, the atonement for us. How could he not be the only name exalted above every name? because he is the only one who could do what he did for the human race. Because he became one of us, so that he could. 
and what a marvelous thought that he knew everything he was giving up when he was coming to earth, but recognized that if I don't, they're lost. And I must take on flesh and blood because the wages of sin is what? Death. See, angels can't die. Okay. Moses died, but he couldn't come back to life because the wages of sin is death. But Jesus could die and come back to life and get rid of the wages of sin and death for those who put their trust in him. So he is far superior. And the message that we read about in Hebrews is make sure that we exalt him and not get him in a different position than he is. So he's the supreme person. He's better than all the prophets because he's the one that fulfilled the prophets. So much better the one who can fulfill it. Um, it'd be nice to you know, read a book and to know about the author. But if he could meet the author personally, wouldn't that be exciting? You know, so it becomes very intimate, doesn't it, when you know them face to face. They didn't, couldn't do that for us until Jesus came. And so he's supreme and all that. So in chapter 1 of Hebrews, when he says, Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers through the prophets. But in these days, he has spoken through his son. And this is important, too, because it, and I speak to you about like this, like this Bible being a big dot to dot. <laughs> if you start at Genesis and connect all the dots, it'd be sort of fun to, <laughs> this is a high point. This, but, but you see how the message is never lost. That's important because you could have a hiccup with it. Oh, wait a minute. We didn't have that message. Somebody missed hearing it. No, no one missed hearing it. They may have missed it. Do people have a chance to hear it today? But they may, may miss it because they don't want to spiritually hear it. Okay, so he spoke and, and, until his son came. But now here's the importance in seeing how the triune God works together. God appointed his son for this purpose. It wasn't haphazard. But then neither was his call to Aaron, to Moses, to Joseph, to Abraham, all the Old Testament patriarchs, to Elijah, name your prophet, Hezekiah. That wasn't haphazard, was it? God said, hmm, well, maybe you'll do. Now, sometimes they wondered, why me? Amos really said, I'm a farmer. <laughs> What's up here, God? Think about Noah. You want me to do a, build a what? <laughs> I'm not a carpenter. <laughs> but... Again, it's important to recognize these weren't haphazard events. It wasn't circumstance or haphazardness that caused them to happen. They were also all appointed for the particular time because God knew what the people needed to hear, which is always the same, but they may have needed to hear it in a fresh delivery from somebody who was relating to their situation at that moment. And we can do that today as the world is struggling to find meaning in life, as the world is looking like it, we're going helter-skelter everywhere. Okay, When we speak the truth, though, the truth doesn't change, but we may speak it in, okay, are you concerned about these things that are happening today? He could speak about those things in each individual time and maybe get their attention. That's a way to open the door to present the gospel. But each person that spoke in the days before Christ came were also chosen for specific purposes at specific time. Always with the idea that the final person to come and finish the work that was started would be Jesus, and so he was far superior. Of course, he was in the beginning creating the world. The world is upheld by his right hand. How much more superior is he then to even the ones who brought the message? In every way, he is superior. He is everything rolled into one. That's why he, we can say he's the Alpha and the Omega. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And in him, all things are held together by the power of his hand. And in him are all the answers because he himself is the answer. We want answers to questions, but we don't want the person who is the answer. Give me a quick fix or give me something I can do. Or give me a little program. I'll go through this program and then I'll fix everything. 
Programs don't fix things. They don't fix people, do they? Now, programs may help you with situations that you're in. It may give you some comfort. You may be able to talk to other people or sharing the same things, and that can be comforting. But they don't fix the problem because it's a sin problem. It's always been a sin problem. But Jesus could come and take on flesh so that he could understand what we're going through because he was going to be tempted, right? But he wasn't going to give in to the sin. I, we're at that point where we need to turn this down, don't we? So I will hobble over here. <laughs> My hobbling is faster than it was. <laughs> I guess that's good. All right. Let's see if that does it. You understand, and I know you do understand, but I, it's important. Why do we care? What difference does it make if we go over and over in this book or any of the and remind ourselves who Christ is? Because we can never have him other than exalted. When he gets down to be real, now we have personal relationships, but when he gets to be kind of our buddy, oh, come on, Jesus, let's go. No, he still has to be God, doesn't he? He has to still be the one who provided our salvation. Otherwise, then we don't begin to see him in his rightful position. That's very dangerous. He cannot be anything other than he is, and we need to remember that. But what a blessing to know that he is everything that he says he is. Because when you need somebody who's a big God, boy, do we have one. All right? So it's vital that we understand that. Okay. And then in chapter 1, he goes on to say that he's better than the angels. And uh, he's more excellent in his deity. Angels don't have any deity. You know, people like to worship angels nowadays or talk about their guardian angels sitting on the shoulder and all those um, things. That's not true. We may have guardian angels, and I think that we probably do, and I think that angels probably intervene and stop things from happening because they're God's messengers, and he can send them. He sent them throughout Old Testament history. You hear many missionaries talking about how there was an intervention that God had to send somebody just at the right time, and I believe those are angels. But they are just ministers of God doing his bidding. But because they're not flesh and blood, they're not sinful once... The evil angels were cast out of heaven. The other angels just do God's bidding. They don't have any choices. They don't experience grace because they're not going to be redeemed. They're just those heavenly bodies doing God's bidding. So they can't die for humans. They can't make us better. They can't teach us. Okay. They may protect us. They may comfort us in a sense that another person might not but we have to keep them in rightful position. And people sometimes want to cross that line. So the writer of this is making sure that people recognize that Christ is supreme. Part of the danger when we want to elevate angels to a different position, it's just sort of <clears throat> easy to say, oh, my guardian angel is with me today, blah, blah, blah. And we forget that if our guardian angel protects us, who ultimately sent them? <laughs> Uh-huh, okay. It always goes back to the superior being, doesn't it? So we can't lose focus of that. And the early church was struggling. I can't imagine what the early church must have been like, except that what we read in the scripture, and particularly in Acts. But some of the notions that were creeping into the church all the time are somebody coming in saying, well, you know, this happened, and what do you think about that? And trying to debate what it might mean without having the scriptures written. We can go to scriptures and read all the scriptures that have ever been written on angels, on sin, on Moses, on Jesus, on God. We can go look it up, right? we got a book. The reason we need to know the book can be in the book. But they couldn't do that. They were creating the story as they were going through the Holy Spirit. So imagine the questions that, they, that might be coming up and how wonderful that God called people in the New Testament to write these books and to help answer those questions so that he could build a solid foundation and then leave that book for the churches hereafter to be able to know where God stands on everything and what our relationship with him is and why it is what it is and exactly who Jesus is. There doesn't need to be any questions left. The ones that we have are the mysteries that God reserves for himself. And we can have those answered in heaven if we remember them when we get there. <laughs> yeah. 
My mom's often said, I got a whole list of questions. I said, Mom, I bet you don't remember one of those when you get there. I kind of hope you don't. I mean, <laughs> I think, okay, and then in, uh, let me see, the end of chapter one, <clears throat> he talks about, um, Again, reiterating about the, the angels, that last verse. And they, are they not all ministering angels sent to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? If you don't have that highlighted and bullet point and all that thing, that's a good one. Who The angels, those angels that sometimes people want to elevate. No, they have to serve us and minister to us and be with us. That's their only mission, as God uses them. Okay. They're not to be worshipped. Okay, they're not to be prayed to. They can't be prayed to. We pray to Jesus, and He can send an angel. That's what He chooses. But it's His call. Okay, so again, let's get this in perspective. Who's superior? Where do we all fit? And then in the same chapter, and then we'll move on to chapter two. God talks about we're. <clears throat> made a little lower than the angels, and we don't have some of their powers, don't we? Because we're made in the image of God with a soul and a spirit that can be born again and redeemed. That really sets us apart from angels. And that's exciting, isn't it? Because we wouldn't want to be an angel. That's not a good trade-off. Okay. The basics of Christianity can be so confusing if you allow things to creep in that cause you to question or if you want to debate. You don't need to debate it. If God said it, that's it. Um, when we were growing up in my church, our young pastors would always tell us, that God said it, I believe it, that settles it. That's pretty good, isn't it? Okay, because who are you going to argue with? God? I don't think so. <laughs> I would like to have a conversation with you, God. <laughs> How do you think that would go? I'm sure I would lose. <laughs> but he knows we're inquisitive. He knows we need some answers, explanations. And again, for the early church who didn't have the scriptures that we now have, how important this was to get all the questions out there. What God knew in his wisdom about us is if the early church had these questions, would we have them? Okay. I've given you the answers. Go search them out if you want to. Here's the danger, and you may hear this from time to time from Christians who are seeking answers. They like to go to a lot of books besides the Bible first. Well, have you read this book? Now, there's some good books out there. There's books that can be encouraging. There's books that can be challenging. There's books that can help you understand things. But the answer has to be biblically based, so why not go to the source first? Then you can go to a secondary book that can help you with the first source. Okay. Remember when, and I'm sure none of you did this, but being an English teacher, I discovered once in a while that my kids didn't always read the assignment that I gave them. There was something called cliff notes out there. <laughs> I read it, I read it, and you may have thought about that once in a while. Okay, but what's the problem with cliff notes? It's Cliff Notes. It's not Emerson's Notes. It's somebody who's reading what you should have been reading and telling you what it says so you don't have to bother with it. <laughs> now, there were times when it was probably a very good idea to do it, and when I realized my kids do it, sometimes I, I would get one and i pull it out, and i said, oh, this? I said, you didn't get this answer there, did you? Oh, no, I said. Because they can't give all the answers, and I'm not saying that those kind of helps aren't, particularly spiritual helps, they're good. But why not go to the source? Why not read the words of the author? Now, of course, in literature classes, my kids, because it's boring. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and sometimes I'd give them that. It is, but it's going to be on your test. <laughs> but God's word isn't boring. It may be difficult. But if you compare what he says in one passage with what he says in another passage, you begin to put all the pieces together and say, this is the message that he wants us to have. So taking shortcuts in our spiritual life can be very dangerous. 
Oh, let's go to chapter 2. <laughs> there's another. <laughs> In chapter 2, the first one, there's a warning. And remember, we talked about that therefore word. <clears throat> which is always important no matter what, in what circumstances, when somebody gives you a therefore, we know instinctively, don't we better listen. Okay, because what's coming after that is usually pretty important and may not necessarily be what we want to hear, <laughs> but it's always something that we need to hear. And so our ears need to perk up and say, okay, what is it that's following here that's so important? So therefore, we must pay much more <clears throat> attention to what we have heard lest we drift away for since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation that's another one of those verses that you should have etched in your brain because when you hear people want to have another form of you know salvation they now how do we escape if we refuse reject the only form and so, again, the writer is building on what he's already told them. You know all those prophets and people that you've heard and talked to you in the past and messages that angels sent down? They're true, right? Can we go back? See, they had a history. They had the New Testament or Old Testament. They could go back and say, well, that happened, that happened, that happened. There's evidence. Put it at the court's feet. Oh, I can prove this happened. See? Oh, that flood did come. <laughs> Sodom and Gorb, yep. It disappeared. Did somebody warn us about it? He said, if all those things come to pass, now that the Son himself has come to bring the ultimate message and the redemption plan in fulfillment by his own body's death, how do you think you're going to escape if you don't choose to believe that? There's nothing left, is there? And that's so dangerous. So we can't play around with that you know and people have lots of reasons for not believing that and sometimes they say well I'll think about it I'll get back to it or it doesn't make any sense but God is very clear if you neglect this how are you going to escape what is he talking about the final judgment the only escape from the final judgment is Christ in you the hope of glory there's no escape how tragic. And yet people know some. They don't want it. They don't want it. They would rather we say that we had an experience with an angel. Oh, really? That's pretty neat. What is, you know, or had this little vision. When they go back to those things, what they're saying is it's something for them, and it's not them recognizing who they are before God. See, we're much more comfortable, right, having a little angel come and help us out. And um, or a, a little vision, God showed me this, everything will be okay, without that whole notion that, did they remind you that you're a sinner? We just don't like that. But if we neglect to recognize who we are and what Christ did for us and why all those things happened as a precursor, a foreshadowing, if you will, of what was going to happen to be the final propitiation for our sins, there's nothing left. God has done everything that he could do. When people, and I may have mentioned this to you before, but I, of course you know me, I always think it's worth repeating. <laughs> but I get nervous or, or concerned sometimes <clears throat> when Christians begin to get um, worried about their own salvation or they think maybe, well, they can't, they're not saved anymore because they fell away. They, and Paul warns you about, or not Paul, the author warns you about drifting away from this. We don't want to drift away and then get caught up in our sinful self again because God will bring discipline. But we'll get into that section later. We are told we will be disciplined because we're his children. That's the good news, right? If you get a good spanking from God, say, oh, this isn't comfortable, but I'm glad you're spanking me because I know I'm yours. If they're getting by with it, they're not his. Okay, <clears throat> But people don't necessarily want to recognize that, and they don't like that part of it. So, so, but don't drift away from the truth because there's no other truth. So when people drift away, then they think, I can find it somewhere else and it'll be something that's easier to do, something that I like better than this. Because <laughs> God's plan is, isn't compatible with mine. I said, but if they receive, because of their disobedience, their just reward, and that's what he tells them, 
Well, I like that big word, retribution. Whether you agree with the case that's been on the news forever, the judgment from the juror gave a retribution for a, a murder, right? Okay. Only gods can be absolutely perfect and just. But he said, if those people who heard the message, who heard their call to repent, who heard the fact that, hey, a flood's coming, here's how you can avoid it. Over and over again, God's going to break judgment if you don't repent. And they heard it. They rejected it. He said, well, if you see by looking back in days past that they got what they asked for, basically, right? So who do you think you are? That you're going to escape that? If you ignore the message? And people believe that somehow. They'll think, well, I'll be okay. I'll be good enough. I think sometimes people think, and of course, this the whole thing is erroneous, that when I get to heaven, I can kind of negotiate with Peter at the door. I have a strange feeling Peter's not at any door in heaven <laughs> waiting on you or me. <laughs> and he's probably appalled at the whole idea, you know, okay? But, you know, we can make an argument. I've even had people say, and I've asked people, well, what will your argument be when you stand before God, why you should be allowed into heaven? And some people will engage with you in that conversation, which is, can be good because you can start to, you know, take them in the right direction. But they think they can kind of defend themselves. But if we go back through history, when God's made judgment, when he's warned people because they didn't repent and that judgment has happened, you think you're going to wiggle out of it somehow? Why? Well, because I'm smarter than them. You know? I won't get caught. My kids that thought they were the cleverest and could get by with things, when I would catch them, and I always did, <laughs> those are the ones I was most determined to catch. <laughs> but you know what they told me? But you were watching me. <laughs> oh, how silly <laughs> of me to be watching you. Is God watching us? He sees everything that's happening. And he's not missing a trick. He's keeping a record. And he's going to open it up. And they're going to think, well, that's not as bad as this. Or you shouldn't have been watching me. Okay, as if we can tell holy God what he should be doing. So our arguments become very not only futile, but how foolish. And we can say that because we're believers and we know it's foolish. But again, the reminder is to either new Christians or to reinforce in the church, don't take it for granted. The real danger, and <clears throat> my sweet friend Judy mentioned this the other night, and she had such a sweet point. She said, I love saying I'm born again because I was born again late. And she said, you know, some of you have been born again for a long time. And she says, I hope none of you take it for granted. It was it's a good conversation, a good thought. I've been born again for 70 years. Then I don't take it for granted, but I know exactly what she means. It could be, well, I've always been a Christian. But how I feel is I've been fortunate to have always been a Christian since that age because I knew that moment he saved me, he saved me, and I've never gotten over that he did. But I love that reminder. Those of us who've been Christian, don't ever take it for granted because it cost Jesus his life. No matter when we accepted it, it was costly for him. And we can't just be satisfied. Yeah, I'm saved. And sometimes churches, I think, have taught it. Okay, you save, you're good, you're fine. Go about your business. No, don't, don't take that for granted. Always stay in love with him. And how do you do that? By serving him, by being with fellow believers, by being in his word, by confessing sin when you need to. It's not just a process that's over and done with. He calls it to work out our salvation in fear and trembling. Our salvation is sealed, but appreciation for our salvation, and they get warned, so don't take it for granted, and just say, eh, I'm good. And if you're good, and you know you're good, you better be sharing with other people, because they're not good, necessarily. All right, so he says, how are you going to escape? And then skip on down to verse uh, 5 in chapter 2. He said, Now it is not to the angels that God subjected the world to come, to which we are speaking. For if, for he testified somewhere, 
What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? For you made him a little lower than angels, and you crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. He said, remember this. This was God's ordained plan. This is how he set it up. And this is a quote from Psalms. Okay. <clears throat> we are made lower than the angels because we are flesh and blood, and we need to be redeemed because we are in flesh and blood. But he also allowed Christ to be made lower than the angels, angels temporarily to be flesh and blood so that he could redeem these same people that he's talking about. And don't you love this thought of a holy and sovereign God? Is What is man that you're mindful of him? Who am I that you think? Do you ever feel that way? <laughs> Who in the world am I? I think that almost every day I, as I say there, who am I that you are mindful of me? And that mindfulness that he has us in his mind, in his heart. And that's each one of us individually all the time. We're that important to him. We're that precious to him. And it's an intimate relationship that he has with each one of us. We can't ever get over that. Or if we should, or if we do, we need to examine our lives and say, why am I over that? Why am I taking that for granted? The danger in the modern church today, in fact, it's been a danger throughout history, actually, because a lot of writers in the 18th and 19th century wrote about that somehow, if you're in the church all the time, and if you've been a Christian for a long time, you can begin to kind of think you actually sort of deserved it that I was really worth redeeming. C.S. Lewis warned us about that. If somehow we think because we look at others or because we are more sanctimonious, we're better, we're more righteous, we're more Christian, whatever term you want to use, and there's a lot of them that express that same notion, well, but I kind of deserve redemption. They don't, you know. I do. Remember, I think I used my mother as a bad example when the rioters or whenever that first thing, she said, oh, those vulgar, mean, evil. You know, she just went on and on and on about them. And those are true things. And I said, guess what, Mom? So are we outside of Christ. And that's the people he came to redeem. See, we can't be sanctimonious all, all of a sudden. I said, no, no. We were never good enough, were we? Now, our sins may be more heinous than others. Our morality may be very compromised. We may have none. We may be very cruel. Those are all possibilities, but they're possibilities in every person that's ever been born because our heart is deceitfully wicked and because we are born into sin and because there is none that is righteous and all need to be redeemed, so we have to sort of get over ourselves. Because we don't know what we were capable of until Christ saved us. Some of us, because of our temperament and the way we were brought up, would never do certain things. It's not in our personality. But that has nothing to do with our righteousness. We're still sinful. The most moral person in the world, apart from Christ, is going to face judgment and spend eternity separated from Christ if he has not repented of sin even if it's just one or two. And Christians can be guilty of having that mindset. And it can be hard to sometimes lump everybody in one group. Okay. Are they all equally cruel? No. And there are a lot of them that are very moral. I would wager to you that 90% of a good, true Mormon is as moral or more, more so than most good covenant members because they're earning their way to heaven, they think. Does that mean they're going to heaven? No, because they're trusting their own morality, aren't they? Their own righteousness. They're going to save themselves ultimately. <clears throat> so your goodness, that has nothing to do with it. And it's reason that we're told over and over, therefore, therefore, remember from what you've been saved. Remember whose you are. Okay, and so he goes on and he talks about that. And um, 
<clears throat> let's see. So it, it talks about in verse uh, 15, for it was fitting that he for whom, by whom all things ex existed should be the one who is perfected through his suffering for our sakes. So the author is saying, and this is such a, a convoluted argument in our view, I think. Some, the author is saying that it makes perfect sense based on this argument he's just given to you <clears throat> that the one who created us in the beginning, the one who is perfection himself, should take on flesh and become the founder and author of our salvation. It's logical in this author's view. And it actually is if you think about the process of what God did. If God made us and created us in his image in the garden that we believe, right? And Jesus was the one who was speaking it into being. And he himself is also perfect as the Father is. And then man messes up because God gives us choice. And now we have a dilemma. There's sin in the world. What are we going to do? God doesn't want to wipe his hands off us because he wants to fellowship with us. So... It's reasonable, this author is saying, as opposed to being way out there. Who could redeem humans? Oh, a uh, perfect human. Yeah. Because he could speak our language. He could take on our flesh. He could suffer and live out a perfect life so he could be the redemption and meet the qualification for death as the wages of sin and then be triumphant and redeem us. Angels can't do it because they're not going to be redeemed. They're not sinful. They're not able to make a sinful choice right now. Okay? Animals can't do it because they're not created in God's image. So who does that leave? Jesus. Good argument, isn't it? But we throw out the others. How could that be? Oh, okay. Because he became one of us so that he could redeem us by being a perfect one of us. It also means, and we're going to get into this more deeply in the study, it also means that he can relate to us in every single way that we relate to each other as human beings and as our needs dictate because of what we go through in this world. So Jesus is in heaven. He sees God's glory. He has created us. We're in his image. He knows the Father's plan. He said, if I go down there and take on flesh, hmm, I can get hungry and thirsty. I can meet a woman at the well and say, I sure could use some water. Jesus, this is comical almost, isn't it? I mean, it's bizarre. I could use some water. You are the living water. We know that, okay? Make your own water. You can do this. I mean, we know this. He's saying, what's he saying? He said, I am willing to give up my right to create that water at the moment so I can talk to a woman at the well who needs the living water. I can give her water, but she'll be thirsty again. He goes there delivered, so he meets her. He has that encounter, and we know that story. But what if he had been a prophet? What if he had been um, a man, a very distinguished man, who did like many would, ignored her or looked down on her and said, I wouldn't take a cup of water from you anyway. And said, or, no, I'm not thirsty. Fine, I don't need any water. No, I'm thirsty. I'm hungry. Why? I mean, those are little things. But why did he have thirst? So he understands our thirst, not only spiritual but physical. Why did he get hungry? So that he could understand that. Okay. Why did he get his heart broken by the betrayal of friends? You ever been betrayed by a friend? Have you ever been hurt by the person you had the most confidence in and most love for? Because nothing hurts more, does it? Jesus says, I know exactly. And in all of those things, he could get frustrated with his disciples because, don't you get it? I told you once. <laughs> when are you going to ever learn? 
what's the problem? I'm in the boat, and you're still scared to death. You know, we don't know how he spoke to the disciples exactly, but I mean, we know the recordings. But all those things, what's he's doing? He's interacting with other human beings, and we're interacting with him as other human beings, and he understands and he cares about it, and he's getting the feel for how we feel so that when we see him as the resurrected Savior at the right hand of the God, of God, we have a high priest that we can go to, and he can say, God, I know exactly how they're feeling. when they took the bandages off at home and I realized that that bandage wrap had been holding all the pain and she unwrapped it and she started working on it I thought oh no 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 no! I'm not going here I'm not going to do this and the pain was so intense at the moment and I had surgery on Good Friday and it was probably about it was a Saturday they came to the house and and that was when I first experienced. But all of a sudden, I just wept. Think about Jesus. I said, "You did this on purpose for me. I wouldn't do this on purpose." Sorry, girl. I'm not. I'd have to think twice. I'm doing it for my daughter. <laughs> but you did this and so much more on purpose. Not just so you know how bad I'm feeling right now. And I said, "That's good. I'm glad you. I'm glad you." But no, you did this on purpose. So my sin could be atoned for. That's how much he loved us. But see, see, he had to be in this flesh to feel that pain. People like to say he didn't feel the pain on Calvary because he was, he did. He had to have in order to do the work he was called to do. So we understand how much that love means and why he had to suffer, and why he had to become a human being. Because flesh and blood had to feel how we feel. But now, as our high priest, when we're going through the tough times, when our hearts are breaking, when we're calling out on behalf of somebody that we love, we know that Jesus has experienced all those emotions instead of somebody who has never experienced what we're going through. One of the hardest things to do, <clears throat> I think, when you're trying to pray with somebody... I mean, you empathize, and you really can empathize with somebody. But if you've never been through what they're going through, you can say, I don't know what you're feeling, but I will pray for you. And those are legitimate prayers. But what difference is it when you have somebody that come and share with somebody that you've been through, and you say, I know that ex exactly. Oh, you do know how bad I feel. Because sometimes, let's be true, sometimes we just want the person who's praying for us to know how bad we feel. I'm hurting, hurting, hurting. I want you to hurt, hurt her with me. And if they haven't been through that, they can't. <clears throat> but if you had a wayward child, if you've gone through a divorce, if you've had whatever those things are, I do know and I can sympathize in a different way. And Jesus said, I'm willing to take on every one of those so that I can sympathize with you. And not only that, so that I can intercede for you on behalf of my father. And I can say to him, Father, it's every bit that bad. And then he can also do what we can't do sometimes when we don't know how to pray. You ever get that? I don't even know how to pray for this. He says, I'll pray for you. And the Holy Spirit is going to intercede with groanings on our behalf. And we don't even need to know what he's saying. He so, said, Lord, this needs to be covered. This needs to be prayed for. And I don't know what to say. I got you covered. I can do it. Why? Because he went through it all so that he truly can not just say, Oh, I'm sorry you're feeling bad. I know. Now, not that we shouldn't say that to people. We should. But <clears throat> that intimacy of having been through the same thing helps a great deal. All right, we better get to oh, time are we? chapter 3. <laughs> Am I losing you yet? Are we good? Okay. Because I know this is our review, but it seems like we haven't done this forever. All right. And we'll get into four. Chapter, we talked about this. This is also related, intertwined. It's hard to break it down. Chapter 3 is talking about him being greater than Moses. And I, I love the idea where it says, you know, if Moses or Joshua or Aaron, if any of those people, and Aaron particularly who was the high priest in the Old Testament, I mean, if any of them could have finished the job and they could have taken care of it, he said it wouldn't needed to be somebody else. But 
because they needed redeeming too. So that's the whole thing. Each one of the people that God called, no matter how godly they were, no matter how justified they were, they were only justified the same way we are, by faith in Jesus Christ. So they couldn't redeem us. They could have an important role in the Old Testament work that God was doing through his people, by Moses in his particular role, even Abraham in his role, Joseph when he was in Egypt at the right time. But they couldn't have done it on their own, and they couldn't because they needed to be saved too. They couldn't be the Savior. Only someone who doesn't need redemption can be the Redeemer for his own race. So we can't elevate those people too much. <clears throat> and when you speak to your Jewish friends, if you do have Jewish friends that you ever try to witness to, you can talk about Abraham and Moses, those people that they um, admire so deeply. And uh, even Muslims I've talked to, they admire Abraham. Sometimes that's a beginning point. Well, what do you like about Abraham? And, and they like about the fact that he was God's man. They think he was a prophet. I said, well, even Abraham needed a savior. See, they all needed a savior. And so it's tying it all together. And so he, Moses was the one that they had on a pedestal. And actually, <laughs> it was kind of funny. And let's pick it up in verse um, 7. <laughs> How much trouble were those Egyptians for Moses? <laughs> they loved Moses and they loved to talk about him sort of after the fact. They talked about him during the fact. Sometimes, remember, they had a rebellion. One time they were going to kind of, we're so tired of his. And didn't they get upset with Moses? You brought us out here. Look at this mess we're in. Well, their human nature was responding to another person who was a human and saying, if you're our leader, why don't you fix things right? And, of course, Moses is doing the best he can, but he's about ready to wipe his hands out of it. You know, and when God threatens to, Moses defends God and says, well, you can't, God, because then everybody will know you're not God, so you've got to, I'm going to stand up for my people. Don't kill them. <laughs> I'd like to, but don't you kill them. <laughs> it was a wonderful part, aspect of Moses' personality. He recognized his position in light of who God was. Because if it could have happened that way, God would have done it, and he could have spared Jesus his life. But again, <clears throat> They were imperfect too, and they had to be redeemed. Nobody in the Old Testament was that God used to bring the message. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, how about Peter? Did they need to be redeemed? Yeah. And we see a lot of evidence in Peter's life, <laughs> particularly. We saw all those bad parts about Peter, you know, that, all the warts and all. He still had to be redeemed. So the writer of this in chapter 3 talks about in verse um, He's going back to that time they wandered in the wilderness. He said, therefore, again, there's that important word, as the Spirit says, today if you harden, or if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the day of rebellion, on the day of testing in the wilderness, when your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years, then I was provoked with this generation and said, they always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways as I swore in my wrath. They shall not enter my rest. This is one of the most compelling and, and frightening passages in all of Hebrews and perhaps in all of Scripture. So because he said, do not harden your heart. <clears throat> to those who didn't know what he meant, the Holy Spirit enlightened this writer to say, take them back to when they hardened their hearts and quit listening to me when I let them wander so long. Time and time again, God had done miracles for him. He was leading from a hideous life of savor, of slavery, and they weren't too far out before they decided they'd like to go back, because that food sure was good. They forgot the burden, the whipped backs, the weight of slavery, because things were bad right now, and that looked pretty good. And we, we know the story, and God finally said, I'm done. With this generation, this is an important lesson in a lot of ways. He was done with that generation who had directly experienced God's mercy and grace as he led them out, had gave them every provision they needed to be protected along the journey, had promised that they would go to the land flowing with milk and honey. And he finally said, your hearts are so hardened, 
that you will not obey. So, okay, have it your own way. At some point, you cannot force a person, can you, to do what you want them to do. And if you have a whole list of things you've done for them, and that's not good enough because they've made themselves so hard inside, remember Pharaoh, with each uh, plague that came, his heart got a little hardened, a little hardened, a little hardened, until God said, you want a hard heart? I'll give you a hard heart. God will give a person a hard heart. If you reject him too long, and it may be where you, like Esau, you can't even find repentance anymore because your heart is so hardened. That's such a dangerous place for anybody to get to. Christians can't get there. But believers can harden their hearts to where they are provoked. But God is going to take this generation out, and what he's going to bring in is a new generation, the younger folks who didn't rebel. They just followed mom and dad. And he's going to take them over. You're going to wander from now on because you wouldn't accept my offer. What can God do if you won't accept the offer? At some point, you said, you have to have it your own way. <clears throat> There's two young people that I'm praying for. Well, one of them is Isaiah, which you all know, and another friend who has um, a friend who has a grandson in circumstance similar. Both young men dropped out of school. <clears throat> now, legally, they can't drop out of school until a certain age or until parents admit to <clears throat> But here's what happened. The parents said, we can't make them go. Okay, what happens if you can't make them? They came from Christian families. They've been loved. They've been cared for. They've had everything they needed. It's not like life is really bad at home. I need to get away. They harden their hearts. I'm not going. I had one parent wisely decide when her student was skipping school, and she said, I don't know what to do unless I come and sit with them every day. And then she said, oh, could I do that? And I said, yes, you could. And she did. Unless I can trust you to go, I will come and sit with you every day. Oh, the student was embarrassed to death. And guess what? He did change. But you can't make a 16-year-old go to school, pick him up. You can drop him off at the door and then go right out the back door. I've seen him do it. What do you do? Of the heart? is so hardened until it softens again toward the one who loves them and wants to redeem them, to the parent who loves them and wants to get them back on track or get them the help they need or offer them something to come back home like the prodigal. The hardened heart will lead them down that path. And God said, okay, I will let this generation die in the wilderness. <clears throat> but what happens? God can't not keep his promise. He promised them what? The land. He was going to take them in. It was just not going to be that older group. It was going to be the younger group. I've heard some people, and I think there's some a hope, hope in this, that you know, people want to know sometimes, what's the age of accountability when you finally think, you know, if a child died at 16, and they hadn't accepted the Lord, you know, are they accountable? These, a lot of people said, you know, I think this gives, they held the adults, which should have been like 18 or 20 and up, accountable, but the children were not accountable. They still had time to be redeemed, and God saved that generation and took them in. So it may give us hope for that window when those kids are struggling now. <clears throat> but God says, you know, I, I can't deal with the heart. And the heart. And only consequences can soften the heart eventually. But they, their heart was never softened. They were still angry with God, weren't they? Nothing he was doing now was satisfying them. And so we know he brought the plague. We know he allowed them, you know, to eat the quail until they got sick. And you know the whole story. So it's a good reminder for us. Don't take it for granted and don't harden your heart. And then look at verse 12. And here's the key. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. So exhort everyone every day that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Remind us, sin is what deceives us. Don't fall away. Don't get caught into this trap. Don't let your heart get hardened against God because you're not satisfied with the way he's taking care of you. Now, it's easy for us to look back and to get very upset with the Israelites, or at least I do. How many of you get upset with those Israelites? 
<laughs> How in the world could you be so kind? But do you ever in your own life, or have you, or you know, people in your own life, where things aren't going the way you want, and there's maybe everything's going wrong, you sort of thinking, well, God, take care of this. Whose timing is perfect? God's, and sometimes we don't want to be in the wilderness for any reason. But when we begin to ignore the blessings that he's given us because we haven't had a new one recently, and we start to grumble, we should never grumble. Who are we to grumble against God? He could just get rid of us tomorrow or today. He doesn't have to do anything for us, does he? We have to, as Christians, sometimes acknowledge, you don't, he doesn't owe us anything. And yet he redeemed us. And so whatever we have is a gift of his. But most of all, we have redemption forever. That can't go away. So why would we rebel against him when he's not answering our prayers the way we want or immediately? Or when we think that he's maybe not being fair as we're, if we were in a position to judge God's fairness, which, of course, we aren't. But he said they just harden. And so you do give in to that. See, have it your own way and see what happens. The good news for some people is after that happens for a while, they're so miserable with themselves for what they've done that God can pull them back and they will be disciplined gently and brought back to where he wants them to be. We know the prodigal son does that. He realizes what a mess he's made of his life. But these people didn't, and God knew they weren't going to ever soften their hearts. So he was going to teach the upcoming generation through whom he would lead them into the promised land, keeping the remnant alive so that all the promises could be fulfilled. He was not going to undo his promise because that would make God a liar. But you guys, you're going to die right here. You can just wander around. How much fun is that going to be? And, you know, if you don't like my man and my quail, I guess they could go try and figure it out for themselves. Don't you think God must say, okay, good. Well, like we do with our kids tonight. Okay, go see how that works for you. And you hate to do that. Can you imagine? That's not pleasant for God because he knows what's coming. Any more pleasant than it is for a parent that sometimes you say, okay, do it your way and then come see me later when you wake up and realize how foolish you were. So they couldn't enter his rest. And this is the important Thing about it. I want us to think about this as we try to move into chapter 4. That he said they would not allow him to enter the rest. Our rest is in Christ when we realize the work is done in us, right? We don't have to work for our salvation. We just rest in it. And he said, you can't enter my rest. And the rest was the land of Canaan where they would go in and no longer be slaves. They would be free to be their own people and to establish their own communities. He said, you can't enter that rest because you refuse what I've offered you. The only rest from our sin and our battling with our unrighteousness and our unwholesomeness and our void and our brokenness is to come to him and rest in what he did for us and just let it go and let him have his way with us because he'll never go wrong, will he? And he is our answer. But we have to let go of whatever we're hanging on to. We can't hang on to Egypt because God won't have another master. We can't serve two masters. He told us that very clearly. They made their choice. And this is the important thing. God gave them many opportunities. He gave them what they wanted. Ultimately, that's what happens if we rebel long enough. So he was warning them about not entering their rest. So... <clears throat> Look at the last verse, chapter 4, verse 18. And to whom he did, did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to these who were disobedient. So we see that they were unable to enter the rest because of disobedience. There's the key. Disobedience is what God demands of his followers. If you are disobedient, you will not be having rest for your soul until you confess that sin and become obedient again. God will not tolerate ongoing disobedience in the life of his children. You didn't tolerate it in your child's life. How many of you ever had to discipline your child? (laughs) 
And it wasn't necessarily because we wanted to. Sometimes it was, and sometimes it was difficult to do it, but we knew we had to. And so God would do it. But he said they never entered his rest because their disobedience, their choice, God made all the provisions. If you don't want what he offers, if you neglect this great salvation, there's nothing left. They never entered his rest. Now, this rest is an interesting thought, too, because what did God do on the seventh day? He rested from all his works. And it's like, I've accomplished what I wanted. Now I can enjoy my accomplishments. He wants us to do that. When we become his, we can rest in him because we don't have to worry about our salvation. We know we are in him, and we have that perfect peace and that perfect rest. People who are struggling, who are broken, who are looking at everything in the world to fill that void are not at rest. In fact, many of them are frantic. They go from here to there, to something else. And they may not even recognize it, but if you talk to them very long, you see that that's what they're doing. Because everybody longs for that rest that takes away that burden and eases their heart. But they couldn't. But the reminder is not because God didn't want them to, but God wasn't going to make them accept it, was he? God will not make any of us become believers. He will accept our no. Because he only wants us to come because we can't help ourselves to come into his rest because he loves us so much. Okay, how are we doing on time? Is it about time to wrap up? (laughs) I didn't even get to chapter 4. Okay. Let's introduce it briefly and then we'll pick up here next week. I hope this hasn't been too redundant. I thought we needed to build into this next section because we have another there for us. (laughs) While the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear, lest any should seem to have failed to reach it. Okay. He's given all this gloomy forecast of what happened to them. Okay, go, you're wandered, you're fine, you're done, I'm done with you. Okay. You didn't want to believe me, you didn't want to be obedient. Okay, you're not going to have any rest. Well, that'd be a terrible way to end, wouldn't it? Therefore... A warning. The book of Hebrews is filled with several warnings to, based on what we just told you, and this is all God's truth, right? Based on this, therefore, be careful that you don't disobey, disobey so that you get into that wandering like they did, so that you don't enter my rest. Be warned that you can get to that point where finally God isn't going to always strive with man. There is a point when people can say, I don't want ever to hear his name again. I don't want you to talk to me about it. And God at times will say, that's okay. You've made your choice. I'm going to let you live with it. So you will never. He said, don't get to that point. Don't reject him so that you get to the point that they did where there's no return. Because what God wants more than anything else is for us to want to enter his rest into his salvation. And there's no other plan if we choose to reject what he already has given us. He said, so, for the good news came to us just as them, but the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. For we have been, we who have been believed have entered his rest. As he said, if you believe in me, you've entered my rest. Okay, the warning is, again, they entered it in. Here's the the point, and this is where it comes back to us as individuals. Not because God just got fed up with them because they were stubborn and rebellious, which we all realize they had a right to do, and we do that with people, right? No, they didn't believe. They didn't believe. we got to believe, right? What do you believe? What God says is true. If you don't want to believe it, if you want to mitigate it, if you want to change it, if you want to make it more palatable for yourself, you're not believing. So he's putting the blame totally on the person. And this helps us when we hear some people say, I can't believe a loving God would send anybody to hell. Did he send them to wander in the wilderness? No. 
He sent them to the promised land. On the way, they became disobedient and made a choice. This is where I want to stay. And that's what people do when they reject Christ. And it's never his will. But he can't force people to believe. The word believe can be concerning for some people or it can seem more complicated than this. Well, believe what? You know, I know we'll say, well, believe the Bible. Believe what God says is true. Believe in a God. Well, how can I believe him? I don't see him. Others. But what we know that God has told us, again, so that we have the argument on our side based on his words, that every man is without excuse because look around you. <laughs> look at that world. Did you get up and you breathe without thinking about it automatically? And even with a bum, bum leg, you put one leg in front of the other and you can walk. And you didn't have to stop and think about it. Well, I might think a little harder now than normal. <laughs> the process, what's going on? Our body, he created, who created it? That's just a fluke. So I don't know if I believe in you or not. That's again, that Satan's lie, isn't it? And he said, be warned about all those things that would cause you not to offer this great salvation, which if you reject, there is nothing left then. Because God has done everything he can do. Now he's offering you his son. What will you do with Jesus? This passage, some of these passages say, Consider Jesus, who for the glory set before him endured the cross. Now, that's hard to believe. In that. But he did that, and we know it experientially, not only because the Bible tells us, but because we felt that. So we want to enter his rest and to recognize what it is. But it's the disbelief, it's the deliberate choice on behalf of those who want to reject it because it doesn't fit what they want for their life. And it's convenient to say, oh, I don't believe that. But they believe a lot of other myths. Don't they? Without question. Without the evidence behind it. So... We are invited into the rest of the Father forever and ever. Okay, I think we're going to need to stop with that because we need to dig in really deep to chapter 4, and I, that's where we'll be next week. <laughs> Any questions? Did I confuse you? Thank you for joining Mary Ann's study of the book of Hebrews. If you enjoyed today's lesson, please be sure to click the like button and also subscribe and set your notifications by clicking the bell. Thanks again for watching. Have a blessed week and we'll see you next time.